Uh, so with that in mind, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Salvador Munoz and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Outreach at Poster House, which is of course the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Survival Pending Revolution. And today we are incredibly lucky to be joined by artist and organizer Gail Asali Dixon in conversation with design historian Colette Gator. Together in this wine raging talk, the two will discuss Dixon's personal experience as a member of the Black Panther Party and her work on the Black Panther newspaper, as well as uh, the role of women in the party in general. Uh, before we get started, I do just want to share a few notes on accessibility for this event. Uh, automated closed captioning is available for those who desire or prefer it, and you can turn it on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be made available for all registered attendees uh, on our YouTube page after the event. Um, so if you've missed a portion, don't worry, you can uh, rewatch it at your leisure. Um, and if you have any questions during the program, uh, we ask that you save them for the Q&A portion of the event at the end, or you can drop them in the chat or Q&A box at any time, and we will revisit them during the Q&A portion. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Gail and Colette. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming. And I'm so happy to be here in conversation with Gail. Dixon from Richmond, California. So I want to start by showing you some images of, uh, of Gail's work from back in the time of the party and also current work. So let's get on with that. For those of you, oh, it says screen sharing is paused. Why is that? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, let's see. Salvador, do you have any idea why my screen sharing is? Oh, resume share. Okay. Resume share. Please resume. <laughs> Come on. Uh, let me stop it and go and try it again. Share screen. All right. So I'm hoping that everybody sees a slide that says the Black Panther. This yeah, is an okay. image that I took back in April when I first visited the exhibition and learned more about Black power posters and Black liberation movements. There's a display of Black Panther um, newspapers, as you can see here. And the reason they're in a poster exhibition is that the front and back pages of the newspaper were posters and they were some of them were reprinted as such and sometimes people just tore them out of the paper and put them up as posters. Emery Douglas was the first artist for the party starting in 1966 and was joined by many other artists over the years including several women. Keep in mind that women were rarely employed by newspapers or as artists or illustrators at that time. Gail Dixon, who signed her name Asali on her work, was one of the artists who joined the team in 1972. Her drawings often depicted current events and called people out by name. Her, her, here you see Pat Nixon in the background, the president's wife, Richard Nixon's wife, as a black woman worries about how she will pay her bills without a decent job. The, title of this drawing is All the Cotton is Picked, Miss Anne now has a washing machine, a dishwasher, and only a few menial jobs are left for us. So Miss Anne is a nickname for a generic entitled white woman. Issues like inflation were depicted along with everyday black women who were trying to make ends meet. So this image could have been made recently with all of our recent inflation problems following the pandemic. Um, but notice how lovingly and carefully Gail depicts Black women. One of the key things the Black, New Black Panther newspaper did 
was to connect international Black liberation, U.S. politics, and everyday survival in a way everyone could understand. So this woman's caption reads, I'm against the war in Vietnam. I'm for African liberation, voter registration, and people's survival. Survival pending revolution, which is the name of this conversation, is a concept we'll explore. Black people primarily had to survive and use our power in the established political process, which is not usually how people think about what the Black Panther Party was doing. You see here flyers for Shirley Chisholm for president, reelect Ron Dellums. Ron Dellums ser served in Congress for decades, and he was elected partially with help from the Black Panther Party back in the early 1970s. Elaine Brown it became a, <clears throat> an Oakland City Council woman. Bobby Seale unsuccessfully ran for Oakland mayor, but this shows how directly the Panthers were involved in the established political process. Contrary to the media depictions of the Black Panthers as violent perpetrators, intent on overthrowing the US government, the Black Panther newspaper encouraged people to vote for candidates who would re represent their issues. Barbara Lee is another Panther era Black politician from the Bay Area. As demonstrated in recent news, sometimes the people trying to overthrow the government are always already on the inside. Gail Dixon and the other Black Panther artists humanized and personalized Black struggles by drawing people who looked familiar to them, but were rarely shown in mainstream white dominated media. This caption says, Nixon's got the cost of gas so high, I reckon I'll have to go back to cooking the little bit of food we got on the old wood stove. Again, a very human depiction. Richard Nixon, who, if you don't know, resigned in, you know, humiliation, and he was about to be indicted, and he resigned instead of that in 1973, I believe, uh, or 74. Anyway, this is from 1973, shortly before he resigned, and one of his trademark phrases was, now, I just want to make one thing perfectly clear. This is one of Gail's drawings that shows how, uh, is an example of the political cartoons that were prolific in the newspaper. This is a page from the newspaper that's given away in the exhibition that's about the women in the Black Panther Party. You can see Gail's bio and her illustration down on the bottom. So today, Gail pursues art that continues her search for truth and justice. She practices acrylic painting from real subjects that inform paintings from her imagination and that illustrate her continuing dreams for a better world. So the image on the left is of homeless people and the one on the right is after black, is about Black Lives Matter protests. And this final image is drawn completely is painted completely from her imagination. And I'll let her tell us about that a little later. So now that you've gotten a chance to look at some of her work, let's find out what's behind it. To get started, let's begin at the beginning. Tell us about how you became part of the Black Panther Party and joined the team of artists working with Emory Douglas. First of all, greetings to everyone, and thank you, uh, Poster House, for uh, bringing me on board, and thank you, Colette, for interviewing me and uh, connecting with me. Uh, I'm going to try and make a long story short, uh, because we all have come into being members of the Black Panther Party through so many different ways, but my involved uh, a consciousness raising process. And uh, in 1966, I graduated from uh, high school. I'm on my own, working my own job, earning my own money, living on my own, and about to hit the streets. 
but also I am attending uh, tuition free community college, first Laney and then Merritt. And uh, at, May, at, at Merritt Community College, it's this hotbed of social uh, awareness and political uh, awareness and cultural uh, awareness. And I'm becoming uh, self-aware in all of those categories for the first time. Um, and the arts are very prolific in communicating uh, what's going on in the world. And um, so that, that is the general picture of uh, me coming into a consciousness. And, and my mother is attending community college at the same time. And so we're uh, becoming very political. We're listening to Malcolm X speaks on the record player at her house, you know, so that is happening. Then in 1968, little Bobby Hutton gets murdered by the police. And um, by this time, I've met my husband, and we're down protesting the murder of Bobby Hutton, um, the housewives market not hiring Black people, even though it uh, survives off a lot of Black people's money. And the fact that the Port of Oakland, we were demanding more control of uh, city resources that were coming uh, to the port of Oakland, which was in West Oakland. And we were demanding for the black community greater uh, control over uh, city re financial resources. So all of this is going on. I get married. Uh, my What I realized is that my husband wants to join the Black Panther Party down here. The, the system is, the membership is closed. So we decided to go up to Seattle. And in Seattle, we serve a year in the free breakfast program. And then in 1970, we joined the Black Panther Party. We decided to join the Black Panther Party because we are trying to uh, uh, contribute, do our part to contribute to the change that we feel that has to happen in order for people to feel the freedom that we are propagated that says exists in this nation. Mm -hmm. And um, we joined at a time where survival, pending revolution, the survival programs are being emphasized, re-emphasized again. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So um, one of the things that's important to contextualize is that the Black Panther newspaper started in 1966, two years after the civil rights movement was passed, which uh, which legally enforced segregation and limited opportunities, jobs, schools, everything for black people. So it was, you know, Jim Crow was actually and de facto the law across the US. So just two years later, these, these young people organized the Black Panther Party. So what were the conditions at that time that motivated people to begin this work? Oh, <laughs> well, you know, Oakland, um, it, 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 um, I can tell you like my personal condition, growing up, we grew up in a segregated neighborhood. You know, I had food insecurity issues. Um, during that time, when I'm starting at Merit and becoming involved involved in um, all this awareness, um, and my mother begins to go to the school, she was a seamstress, and uh, we were in an automobile accident, and she had a scar that went from her nose to her ear, and her employee employer came to the house and decided that she was too disfigured to work yet to work. Uh, at at her Breckenridge Bridal Salon. So that's just my experience, you know, but multiply that to the whole uh, city, the state, the nation. Mm -hmm. And I believe the uh, we were tired of watching what was going on in the civil rights movement, the, the uh, uh, youth, being uh, hosed and, and bitten, 
by dogs and children being bombed into churches. And, and um, we were just tired of seeing that. And the, one of the first uh, uh, survival programs of the Black Panther Party is uh, Huey and, and the early members in the black community, trailing the police and informing the people of the community of their legal rights to be witnesses to the harassment that's going on and to bear arms uh, because California was an open carry state and that we had a right to just self defense and as opposed to taking self and being beaten up, et cetera, et cetera, uh, because we're black. So uh, I believe that those, it, it had reached a point in the communication through the arts, it had just reached an, uh, um, a critical mass point. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for giving that context. So just switching gears a little bit, how did you come to use the name Asali? <laughs> my when me and my husband first got together, he thought I was sweet as honey and the solid man, honey in uh <laughs> okay, that's great. All right. Um, so that explains that. So one of the other things that's important is the role of women in the party and can you explain, you, you've explained this to me in terms of that it was organic and due to a number of different factors that came together. Can you explain that a bit? Yes, you know, we, all of us, women, men, et cetera, we all come in for different reasons, you know, for diff because of different experiences. But we were coming in for a common purpose. And, um, you know, uh, the party is started by men. And uh, Huey and Bobby get together and they ask, they get a few other guys together. And it started by men. Women come in and we join together. Tarika Lewis, who was another woman artist, and she comes in. And uh, Matalaba, I believe, was her name at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, she's one of the first original uh, women members. Mm -hmm. And uh, in six, 1969, Hoover said, he will destroy the party. And in 1969, a lot of, of Black men in the party are murdered. Like Fred Hampton, Bunchy Carter, John Huggins, um, and, and little Bobby Hutton in 68. And a lot are exiled. The O'Neill, they're exiled uh, into Africa, Asada's in Cuba. And um, there's uh, they're jailed, they're exiled, they're murdered. And so um, I guess it's sort of organic what happens. And plus we're emphasizing survival programs. We're creating new survival programs. The Oakland Community School comes into existence um, in 73. Uh, we have the SAFE program because Arlene saw a, a need and suggested it. And, and so now we start the first senior, uh, uh, um, I forgot what they're called, but anyway, it's a, we have a van and we're taking seniors to the store and grocery shopping and to the bank because they would be, at that time, if the money wasn't coming automatically to the bank, you got a check and um, seniors were being robbed. And uh, we have a lot of programs that in different states, different programs that were special needs for those communities like there was a plumbing program in one of the, the chapters and shoe mm -hmm. program etc so it it sort of evolves or right right, right, right. Yeah. It, see, it seemed to me that you know looking i've looked through the papers over time and um there was a you can see where there were fewer guns and more kitchens, you know, the focus turned to the home, which seemed to be ground zero for where the hardship was and where people were really struggling. And from what I understand, that is how 
people came to be more sympathetic to the party, especially in the Black community. Can you talk about that a little? Uh, I can talk about that in retrospect. Um, in the, in the, I was on the host committee for the 50th anniversary in 2016. And uh, um, that was a very, actually it was an accident that I wound up on the host committee, but it was a very good thing for me to reevaluate that part of my life. And so uh, it was after the exhibit, I was at church one day. This is just an example to kind of answer your question, long and short. And uh, this lady uh, came up to me and she said, she said, um, you know, when I was coming up, my mother told me, you better not join that Black Panther Party. You better not go around them or anything because the image of who we were that was projected out of the propaganda. And so she said, but I'm looking at all the survival programs that you guys put out there and we're working on and emphasizing and the newspaper is a survival program. And she said, you guys were doing ministry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? And so bottom line, that's what we were doing, whether we were conscious of it or called it that, right. or not, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that is also uh, uh, picking up from the uh, uh, civil rights moving forward from the, the baton that we took from the civil rights movement. We took the voting baton and mm -hmm. the survival program, the ideas of uh, surviving mm -hmm. um, as we uh, strategize and work for change. Right. So that's where the the term survival pending revolution came from. Um, that ide ideology became the party's focus after Huey Newton was released for prison, from prison after his appeal. And um, explain what that means exactly and how it motivated your drawings in the paper, the idea of survival pending revolution, which I, I take to understand as we have to survive until things can change and that might take a while. Yeah, and that's that's how, you know, I'm just giving you my my uh, take on it, but that's how I saw it. You know, survival pending revolution to me translated to survival pending total change from what is to what if. Mm -hmm. What if higher education or education for a trade was affordable to every everyone you know who wanted one and what if there was no hunger in america and what if everyone had decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings and what if you didn't have to constantly think about surviving and you can focus on your purpose of being here on this earth and what if there was an end to this endless these endless wars of aggression etc what if the uh prison system uh that didn't exist the way it is as a torture chamber you know, as a, a place for political uh, dissent and, uh, uh, or a place where prisoners were even disenfranchised, you know, a, the new plantation. And what if there was no longer any god awful inhumane prison system or political prisoners? Or what if the environment now, and, and we were conscious of the environment being uh, threatened at that time. What if we were uh, actually in relationship to the environment right. and, and recognizing the potential dependence. So to me, total change, that the, it, it was total change and survival meant that. And so my images, um, first of all, you have to understand that um, my worldview is women. I'm raised by a single parent. I'm raised in a neighborhood where there's a lot of single um, women raising their children, et cetera. And so I'm, I um, not consciously, it's unconsciously, I'm sympathetic towards images of children and women and uh, um, what we what we are doing to survive, you know. So these are the images I put in, I, I, I find and I draw. Either I find the images or they're out of my imagination or um, they're photos or what have you. And then as a cadre, we work together to come up with uh, the language. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, thank you. I don't know if I answered the, did I answer the question? You did. Know. You absolutely did. So, so that kind of uh, leads into this idea. Uh, Emery talks often about the, this idea within the party of each one teach one. And it went along with the ideas of being a collective and collaborating. And uh, you said that on working on the paper, even though there were very tight deadlines that came out every week, and the paper was being sabotaged, being spied on, people were being followed. For those of you who are graphic designers, I've seen Emery's um, FBI file and the FBI knew what PMS color was gonna be in the paper <laughs> for the following week. So within the context, you know, actually being under siege, you said to me in a conversation that it was a calm atmosphere working on the paper. Can you talk about that? And how did yeah. that help? Um, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if I can give you the, the best, but let me just say this. Working on the newspaper, joining the Black Panther Party was an educational process, number one. You know, uh, up in Seattle, we had uh, PE classes and we studied uh, and my husband and I had read at least a third of the book that was on the required reading. But when I came down to, when we migrated back down to Oakland and I uh, was assigned to the newspaper, I typeset a lot of the articles as well as laid them out, as well as drew from uh, uh, many of the images, mostly on the back pages, but some on the front and some in the middle inside the uh, newspaper itself. Mm -hmm. But that, that was a great learning process and um, understanding um, uh, for me, because like, for example, I type a lot of intercommunalism <clears throat> articles that <clears throat> were uh, explaining Huey's uh, 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 concept of intercommunalism. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, under, I could see I'm learning as I'm uh, working on the newspaper. I'm also learning and understanding the broader picture, how we're all interconnected and we're all interrelated and interdependent. And uh, uh, not just, yes, Black people primarily, but Black people in connection with other people and other communities worldwide. That, uh, and, and and that the the oppressor there's a common oppressor and uh, it's linked to the religion of capitalism, you know. And um, uh, so that is um, a growing that's happening with me. And I'm also typesetting about Oakland, a base of operations. So I'm getting we're survival pending revolution. And we're working through this election process to make Oakland a base of operation so that we can uh, make this survival pending revolution of, and bring it into fruition. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. So after, uh, at, at one time, you ran the Oakland, the art program in the Oakland Community School. Why was that important to you personally and to the Liberation Project overall? Okay, I don't know if I actually ran the program. I, you know, Emory, I worked with Emory first on the okay. uh, program. And then uh, I, I was able to do some uh, individual planning. You know, being young and gifted and Black, you, the stuff <laughs> just comes to you, you know, it's just Rain down, you know, and so uh, I did uh, teach uh, some independent. I, I I taught preschool, and I used art as a tool for teaching the preschoolers their cognitive things that they needed to learn in order to move to the next level. And then, but I also taught art at the school uh, in general. Now, and tell me what your question was. Oh, what well, was just your... how did that? Why was it important to teach art to the young people? Um, because they're taking art out of public schools left, right, and uh, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, for me, 
not that I was conscious of it then, this conscious way of thinking then, but to me, art is so relevant to helping uh, understand things that may be a little difficult to grasp. Mm -hmm. um, let me give you, and it helps make the mind work in a different way. I, if I have time, I'll give you two quick examples. Okay. One, is, one is very recent. I was um, a substitute teacher for a math class. Now, me and math, mm -mm. but I had to teach them about exponential numbers. Now, that is very abstract. That is very, uh, how does that relate to my life? I'm a kid, you know, and so I understood what the instructor was trying to explain. And so then, therefore, then I began to uh, uh, translate it. And so I drew a picture because exponential numbers, they get larger and larger as the percentages grow. And I showed that there are some of us living underwater. There are some of us living with our head just above water. There are some of us that are barely standing above water. And then there are those, the few 1% that's up here making a lot of profit. And so I was able to help them understand about exponential numbers by showing them how it relates in, in real life. That's one. Uh, the other example is at the school itself, I was teaching children for this one example that I remember about geometry, about shapes, and how shapes are part of our lives. And um, we, uh, I, I don't, I'm gonna try and make it real short. We had old doors, the old doors had skeleton key uh, locks, and so there's a hole and there's a triangle down here. And I had the children look for these two shapes. But the thing is, and, and they had to think, and they had to uh, exercise their imagination. And so to me, art is an important tool uh, for self-expression and for learning about the world around you. And it communicates, it's a language that's very powerful to communicate with, uh, uh, especially if the way they're taking uh, knowledge out of the schools these days, and, and some of the children are, are graduating halfway illiterate, you know, and some of the people back then had, um, uh, uh, may have graduated from high school, but they had equivalent to eighth grade uh, uh, um, education. I'm not sure if I answered that as clear as I'd like to, but. Um, no, no, that's great. Well, I want to make sure we have time for questions. And, um, but before we go to that, I want you to, Tell us about how your previous work on the Black Panther newspaper connects to your personal work. And the way that I see it, what I've noticed is that um, the, the same things are motivating both. They're just in different media and different kinds of expression. But how do you reconcile um, the fact that even though many of the problems are still alive and some of them have gotten worse. I don't know if homelessness is worse, but it's very bad. Um, but how, how do you balance the fact that some things actually have improved and some things haven't? And how, how do you keep from being discouraged? <laughs> it, it is my art. And, um, I'm very angry, I'm very mad, I'm very tired because we keep, I mean, just as an example, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1866 that gave us as black people outside of slavery, we're equal, supposed to be equal. And, right. and, and so many, I just want to interject here, so many people do not know that, yeah. <laughs> that it was passed and then rejected by the and, Supreme Court, yes. 1866 and 1868, uh, uh, Amendment 14 was enforced. So we've had like six civil rights acts basically saying the same thing. It's all about the civil part. 
And what the Black Panther Party was doing, even though I wasn't fully conscious of it at the time, but we were moving things to a human rights level. And that's a different level. And that's where I, uh, uh, it, it gives me, well, I don't, I don't have a lot of faith in uh, this system, but I think as long as we keep moving it to a human rights level, that there, there is hope for change. And that's where I keep, um, um, that's what keeps me, well, first of all, that's what keeps hope in me. Second of all, my, um, I've been working on, since 2010, developing my, um, I was afraid to use acrylics, and so now I'm not afraid to use acrylics now. And so I've been moving into acrylics and working um, uh, on ideas that are basically what I've learned since during the Black Panther Party. Intercommunalism is all about us being in a community uh, uh, that is interdependent and, and interconnected uh, worldwide. And um, uh, um, education, point number five, we want education that teaches us the true nature of, of this uh, decadent society that we live in. And so that's the, the uh, I don't have any examples of those images right now, but that's the images that I'm working on now. And especially since they're taking, they're taking out our history and distorting it, uh, um, uh, using Florida as an example, and um, saying that critical thinking is something's wrong with that, it's, uh, which is ridiculous. But at any rate, um, so, Art is um, a powerful tool to communicate and, and connect ideas, connect different, several ideas, and uh, reach people down into this part that's deep down in here, not just the intellectual mind, but they can go into their heart. And that's, a, that's a great answer. Thank you. Well, I want to open up for questions. And uh, William Cordoba has, at, has um, asked a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, I don't know if you want me to read them or if you'd like to, to ask them. I believe that Salvador has opened up for people to, oh, we're asking them in the chat. Is that how it's working? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, you can drop your questions in the chat or the okay. Q&A box. Um, okay. And uh, Claude, I'm happy to read them unless you would like to. Oh, I can read it. Yeah. Um, let's see. All right. Let's look at, let's ask this one. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, this is a great one. Okay. So this is from William Cordova, who's a wonderful artist <laughs> who has worked about and with Emory Douglas. He asks, food can symbolize social intimacy and art can symbolize a way not only for children to express themselves, but also adults to examine the psychological and emotional undertones of an individual. Can you speak about the art and dinner program you created for the South Berkeley Community Church? <laughs> Somebody. Yes. Um... I was the um, pastor of South Berkeley Community Church. And, um, you know, art is my heart, my love. And when I graduated from seminary, one of my mentors, she was like, let us get involved and do some painting. And that got me back into my painting again. And the kids would come and they would help with the, doing the project. And one day, one of the children, uh, I asked them, um, something came up and I asked him what they have for dinner and he said he had potato chips. His mom was struggling with uh, drug issues and he said he had uh, potato chips. And so um, I was able, you know, things just fell into place and I was able to get money from uh, the city of uh, Berkeley, piggyback off of the hunger program that already existed. And we started uh, a, art, a Friday night art and dinner program. The, the, the goal was to make it every night, but it only 
it only happened for Friday. And um, we would teach children uh, using food. We would introduce them to, to food from around the world, and they could also learn to be uh, learn the art of cooking in the kitchen. Those that were interested in it, and um, we were teaching them art. The goal was to teach them art from various cultures. And um, um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I hope I did. So that was how it got started was one kid telling me he had potato chips. And of course, that goes right back to the <laughs> Breakfast for Children program for me, you know. And of course, the art is about communicating in a language that is universal. And food is universal. Okay, great. Um... Thank you for that. So Kimberly Perrette asks if you're planning on giving any classes. Do you teach classes now? Um, so far I have. Okay. Um, and then Nikki Enright. Hey, Nikki. <laughs> Why did your BP artwork make heavy use of photography while your later personal painting does not? Oh, that's interesting. Um, and I'm assuming when she says photography in terms of me choosing the, the images, um, you know, we were pressured under deadline. We put that paper out every week. And I typeset the paper, I laid out the paper, I drew, drew the images for the paper, and we did corrections for the paper. And so, and, and um, I, I'm, I, uh, Emery would, you know, he was part of the central committee. So the ideas of whatever that they wanted to focus on, um, we get it as a cadre and then we just move, you know, and um, I'm I'm not your, there's a lot of graphic artists that can take an idea and run with it and go like that. I, I'm not that kind of person. I, I do need those images a lot of times to uh, reference. And um, so that's why I did that. Long story short, I did that. Okay. Well, here's a question from the great Lincoln Cushing, who is one of the important archivists of activist posters, especially from the Bay Area. And he says, thank you for your movement service. Although many of Emory's Black Panther Party newspaper illustrations were reprinted as posters. I don't know if any of yours were disseminated that way. Is that true? And if that is true, why not? Why were they not put out separately? I, 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 had, I had no idea, and I'm not aware of any. If they are, I'm not aware of any, and I had no idea why they weren't. My, my, you know, just off the top of my head answer this question, I haven't specifically researched this, but I think that Emery's style of drawing became kind of a, a trademark or kind of what we call now branding for the party. And I think when they put, made the posters to go out in communities and everything, it, they were instantly recognizable as, uh, as being part of the Black Panther Party. Would you say that, is that plausible? Gail? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's plausible. Well, and, and you know, he 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 was more prolific. He'd been drawing and painting since, uh, not painting, but drawing since um, uh, 1966. And he's, rec I mean, he organized the graphics arts department, so he's recognized in that way, you know. Um, that, that, I, I I can't I don't have an answer for that. Okay. All right. I think what you said is good. Yeah. Uh, William Cordoba says that no other Panther artist's work was reprinted in poster form. Thank you for that. Um, so Stella Mars has a great question, and I'm going to reshare this image um, so that we can know what she's talking about. I hope you can all see that. She says, uh, thank you for sharing your life stories with us. I was struck by the gaze of your self-portrait. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that was a self-portrait. You can elaborate on that. But no, any, anyway, 
her question goes on to say, I wonder what you see when you look at the gaze of this woman's eyes. What is she thinking about? And see, that's the question I want you, the viewer, to answer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, she, she was a mass of colors. And actually, she was an assignment, but she was a mass of colors. And uh, we were asked to look and see if we saw a face. And so I looked, and that's the face that began to reveal itself to me. And I don't know if it's a man or a woman. It looks Native American to me. But I don't know. I, I want you, the viewer, to tell me what gaze is that you see. That, um, mm -hmm. And for me to check, I can tell you an initial thing for me is, uh, but I, I don't want to influence your thoughts. I want to hear your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I noticed that it's, it is neither a, a angry look, it's, it's right. very straight at the look. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, it's a, a challenging look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it is. It's um it it's interesting that it came from your imagination because it can be, you know, that's part of why it can be interpreted so many different ways, because you're not trying to recreate someone's expression. Um so I just want to go back a minute. I think I missed the first part of Lincoln Cushing's question where he wanted to thank you for your movement service. So Take that in, Gail. <laughs> and Lincoln knows. <laughs> say that I'm sorry, I was reading. Lincoln it. Cushing, who uh, is a um, an archivist of social change posters, social movement posters. Uh -huh. The first part of his comment was, "Thank you for your movement service, Gail." I may have skipped over to the question, so I just want to make sure that you got that appreciation. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's an important question from Rhonda O. Thank you for this talk. Dear Sister Asali, I stay angry and tired too. All of your work shown today easily applies to our current times, i.e. inflation, student loans, jobs, voting rights, etc. What are some practical recommendations for our youth to survive today? Ooh. <laughs> That's a big one. Well, I, you know, uh, get involved in the environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, and the environment is interconnected to everything, everything, everything that you just listed. And um, I just heard about Montana. Did you guys hear about <laughs> Montana? <laughs> Tell them about it again if they don't know. Well, briefly, and anybody can fill it in, um, the youth brought a legal case against the state of Montana and it related to their future existence. And um, help me out, uh, uh, Colette, but they won, they won their case, which set the president all over this United States. And I'm so happy. And you know, uh, Greta Thunberg, um, right. I, I was, I'm proud of what she's doing as young people um that that aren't even getting the uh visibility that these two groups have that are doing stuff that are doing stuff in oakland you know and and i'm i'm just get involved in uh under research understanding the truth about what it is that's going on in your life that you want to talk about and communicate and recognize that if it's all about humanity, love, concern, mm -hmm. community, yeah. uh, if you have to pull on your culture, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and connect it to the environment, because mm -hmm. that's where I'm going. I'm going after I finish this first, this next project that I'm self-imposed project that I'm working on. The environment is move. I'm moving on uh, communicating the lessons from the environment. 
that's the theme that I'll be dealing with, lessons from the environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, let's see. Oh, my goodness. We're running out of time. So I'm going to pick one last question. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Wait, how are we for time? Um, <clears throat> we're okay on time. Uh, we okay. can, yeah, we're okay on time. Okay. All right. So here is, uh, so somebody brought up, I think it was William Cordova brought up whether there are any original artworks and I erroneously thought that there were no surviving original artworks, but Gail has two of them, right? Actually, three. Three, okay. Yeah. And, the and there's one in the exhibition as well in this collection. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that? In terms of my original art? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have um, the, the lady that everybody says is Mom's Mabley that has Shirley Chisholm and Elaine Brown running for city council and Bobby Seale for mayor. I have the original of that. And there's one that you that you haven't seen, but it was on exhibit at the uh, Oakland Museum at the 50th anniversary. A woman a, with a baby in her arms carrying a, a bag of groceries with the original clip art that some of the clip art has fallen out. And uh, so it's just a little bit of the clip art in it. But, um, uh, I, and I've, I've had, they followed me for 50 years and don't ask me how i have no idea but i was going through my art and one day there they were so mm -hmm. i i do have two i have actually three three original mm -hmm. those are extremely rare <laughs> and <laughs> yeah uh someone also asked about exhibiting it would be great to exhibit those originals along with your other work, which hasn't been exhibited? Uh... No, it has. It has those two at the 50th anniversary in 2016 mm -hmm. at the Oakland Museum. Mm -hmm. They were put together, mm -hmm. but just, just, that, just that time. Just right, that time. right. So I wanna just let everybody know about this. It's backwards, but <laughs> this isn't a, a catalog from an exhibition that was at the Norman Rockwell Museum called Imprinted Illustrating Race. And um, this catalog is available at the Rockwell Museum shop. I bought this one, I have a couple, but I bought this one on eBay used <laughs> anyway, just to have another copy. But I wrote an essay about the Black Panther artist and included work from from Gail, from um, Mata Lava, Joan Tarika Lewis, from uh, Bill Teamer, who is now a very uh, accomplished sculptor, rec represented by Jack Shaneman Gallery, uh, a man who passed away. And um, who's the other person? Oh, Malik. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Malik Edwards, who was also a really important artist for the party. And I personally would like very much to see more uh, more of this work exhibited and more well known. So that is in the works. Someone else also asked where people can see your work now if you have exhibits coming up. Well, I do have an exhibit in Point Richmond, California um, uh, at the post office. The US, US government post office. And it's um, 16 images on display there. And I saw it, it's fantastic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it really, it's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of courage to try to learn a whole new medium. You know, I, I'm, I'm in awe of you working so hard on acrylic and having so much success with it while keeping the same ideology that is throughout all of your work, even from the past. Um, let me ask this one other question. Did Ms. Dixon consider leaving the West and joining the movement in the South? Aha, 
I, I'm assuming you mean when there was the civil rights movement yeah, going civil on. Rights movement. Yeah, civil rights. Yeah. You know, when I was, um, I think I was 15, and I was trying to get a, a time frame of the Freedom Ride because um, I remember asking my mother, I, I want to. Now, my consciousness is not that great, but I remember asking my mother, can I go down south and help register people to vote? And, of course, she said, hey, heck no. You know, you're not going down there and get yourself killed. That's what she said, because people were getting killed just to ask people to register to vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very terroristic, traumatizing time, just like now, but different back then and mm -hmm. so yeah yeah I, I i'm not I, I have thought about moving south that was later when a lot of people were exiting back to the south a lot of people were going back to the south um, but that didn't happen so yeah those thoughts have run through my mind from time to time mm -hmm. yeah yeah a lot to think about i just want to point out that Salvador has posted some links for you. There's a link to the Norman Rockwell Museum where you can purchase or get information. Actually, there's a whole symposium on their website that includes Gail and Malik and Emery Douglas in a conversation with me. You can watch that free. And um, there's other information about the exhibition on the Norman Rockwell website. Also at Poster House, the, ex the current exhibition is on view through September 10th, so you still have time to see it. And there's also, uh, there are also a number of, of items, books, et cetera, that are related to the Black Panther Party and the movement that are for sale at the Poster House shop, which is online. You can purchase the third edition of Emory Douglas's monograph, I contributed an essay to it as well as many other people. And there's a third edition now. And just FYI, it's been reduced in price on Amazon. <laughs> so it's now down to like $26 or something like that. And the other two editions sold out. So, and I don't know how many they printed. Also, I get no money for this. You know, I, I got paid. So <laughs> I'm not <laughs> I'm not telling you to buy something that's going to, that is going to um, help me. But I do think it's important that people understand this entire movement. And there is going to be more scholarship on all of the artists, more exhibitions, et cetera. So please stay tuned. All right. Gail Collette, thank you so much for everything that you've shared today. This has been such an informative and far-reaching conversation. It was a pleasure to hear from your lived experience. Um, and thank you so much. This was just such a fantastic program. Again, this was recorded. So if you missed any or want to revisit any of the uh, knowledge nuggets that were shared this evening, you can always go back and rewatch it. Um, and again, uh, Black Power to Black People, branding the Black Panther Party is on view at Poster House through September 10th. If you haven't had a chance to see it, uh, definitely come and check it out. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you thank for you. having thank, us. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. I love this question. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Gail. All right. Thanks, Salvador. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye.